Excellent. I see we've got a couple of people on the chat just saying where they're from. Uh, we've got um, uh, Joe from uh, Eastern Health, Melbourne, Australia. Uh, we've got uh, Liz from Denmark University, New Zealand. Sorry, Dem sorry, Denmark University of New Zealand. I have exactly 9 p.m. Great. Okay, great. Um, should we make a start then? I okay. Think, yeah. Okay, great. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining the first employer webinar um, for the Nightingale Challenge. Uh, my name is Anthony Harbin, and I'm the Global Program Administrator for the Nightingale Challenge. So. Um, all of the applications, etc., that you're sending through, I'm working through them all. And thank you very much. Um, and welcome. So today for you, we have um, Christine Koreshi and Claire Med from ICN, who we're very excited to have um, for our first webinar. So take it away, guys. Okay. Um, hello. My name is Chris Qureshi, and I currently serve as the Global Director for the ICN Leadership for Change Program. Also here with us today is Claire Med. Claire serves as the Program Director for the ICN. We're really glad that you have joined us today. This is the first part of a series of events which will be held to commemorate the 200th birthday of Florence Nightingale. This webinar is being supported through a collaboration between the ICN and the Florence Nightingale Foundation. So today we're going to discuss the roots of modern day nursing and how modern day nursing has evolved. Then we're going to take a look at where we are today and hear some voices from nursing leaders across the world. Then together we're going to look at where is nurses headed into the future? You'll hear some information from Claire about the Leadership for Change program. And then at the end, we hope to have a webinar discussion between all of the people that are on this call today. We encourage you to make comments and think of questions and type them into the text box as um, I'm speaking. We'll speak for about 16 to 18 minutes with a short video clip in between, and then we'll have a discussion among all of us. So nursing is not new. There have always been nurses since recorded history but Florence Nightingale founded modern day nursing and nursing education. Nightingale's theory of man, health, and the environment actually maps to the social determinants of health, which is used in many countries across the world today. So throughout, um, since modern day nursing um, has, um, since the advent of modern day nursing, many initiatives have been started by nurses so let's specifically look at 1850 to 1920 when many of these initiatives, initiatives started. Did you know that the first medical record system and mental health services and military nursing were started by nurses? And the Frontier Nursing Service for Midwifery and Rural Health, as well as Care for the Poor, which was modeled after a social determinants of health um, system, were also started by nursing leaders of that day and family planning and birth control, which was initiated by Mar Margaret Sanger, is an important cornerstone of women and children's health today. All of these nursing initiatives have influenced health policy across the world then, and it continues to do so today. Now the International Council of Nurses, that was also begun by the early leaders in nursing. It was started in 1899, and the first three presidents came from the UK, Australia, and Germany. Today, the president of the ICN is Annette Kennedy, and she comes from the country of Ireland. Annette Kennedy has told us that nurses need to learn how to influence policy. One of the key aspects of the Leadership for Change program is actually to um, um, build capacity for nurses to learn how to influence policy and make effective change. Now let's look at nursing in the first 100 years. Early nursing followed physicians' orders. Formalized interprofessional teams and collaboration were not the norm 100 years ago. Education was task-oriented, 
and many hospital-based training programs um, educated nurses of that day. Most nurses were female, while most of the physicians were male. However, after World War II, many things happened in society that impacted the profession of nursing as well. The roles of women expanded. Men began to enter the profession of nursing. Healthcare technology literally exploded. Medical surgical specialties such as oncology and pediatrics were developed. Critical care units with their high-tech environment were invented. Allied health professions also emerged, such as physical therapy, occupational therapy, etc. Hospitals increased in numbers and size. Much of this increase in hospital sector was influenced by the advent of employer-based health insurance and national health services in some countries. These, these served as a platform for paying for hospital services, which even back then were quite expensive. As, as a result, nursing care followed the patient as they moved into the hospitals and nursing began to leave the community. However, today we can see that nursing is again returning to the community. The nursing profession today, let's take a look at what we're like. Nursing is really an autonomous profession. Nurses are not expected to only follow orders. They're expected to demonstrate critical thinking and deliver nursing specific services as well. Today, in many countries, only about half of the nurses work in hospitals. Interprofessional collaborative practice has become a goal because we know this type of practice results in higher quality care. The profile of nursing has increased and nursing has a seat at the policy table in the international arena, in many national as well as local locations as well. Okay, so now let's talk about some of the things that have just started and will be staying with us as we go into the future. Have you heard of the quadruple aim, otherwise known as value-based care? It includes four key strategies. One is to improve the health of the patients and populations. To do this while you have satisfied patients and clients, but of course at a reduced cost. And what has recently been added is satisfied providers. That's you, you're the provider. It now has been widely recognized and acknowledged that the workplace environment of the nurses is extremely important because an adequate supportive workplace environment also supports a um, way for nurses to provide quality care. That also includes an uh, a, a high quality work-life balance as well. So there'll be a lot of work um, focused in this area um, going forward. Now, interdisciplinary collaborative practice. This has now become the norm. Let's think about it. In many countries, if a person has a stroke, they receive care from a nurse, from a physician, from a dietitian, a physical therapist, a social worker, and maybe even a pharmacist. However, as we go into the future, nurses are the key people who are leading these interdisciplinary teams. Now we're getting a little bit more, um, let's talk about technology and the omics revolution. We need to start to have this discussion. Where does nursing fit in with the omics re revolution? When I talk about omics, we mean microbiomics, genomics, proteomics, epigenomics, how will nursing contribute to the omics? Will we be the people who translate omics to the everyday person in the community? Will we be tailoring our nursing care based upon the genomics of the individual or looking at our populations different based upon the epigenomics of the local community? These are things that nursing needs to know about and needs to learn about. Now let's talk about precision health services. This is now becomes an extension of the omics revolution. We are now able to tailor, custom tailor care for the individual patient based upon their genetic composition, their physiological status, as well as the world, the, the context in the world that they live in. How will nursing care be tailored based upon um, precision health for the individual person? Will there be precision nurse care services as opposed to precision health care services? Telehealth. Telehealth was invented a very long time ago. It is here to stay and it's commonly used for chronic disease management, 
health and mental health services? How will we skill up the nursing workforce to fully engage in telehealth? Are we teaching this in our schools of nursing now? Do we have faculty who can teach students? Do we have faculty who can actually teach nurses in practice? These are things that we're gonna to have to think about as we move nursing into the future. So now I'm gonna spend just a few moments speaking about the Leadership for Change program. It was, the program was started in 1996 and it has prepared nurses with enhancing their leadership skills to enable their ability to improve nursing practice and achieve better outcomes. It targets nurses who are specifically in management roles who are in a position to affect organizational change. In 2018, the ICN supported an update of the LFC program. Currently, the program is highly interactive. Content spans a very broad range of management leaderships and concepts, but it's not all, as we call it, chalk and talk. It actually involves three face-to-face -face workshops. Each workshop includes very short didactic presentations, that are usually followed by highly entertaining, uh, entertaining TED Talks. Then the groups break out into small um, groups where they have case-based small group work activities. And now the groups come back and report to the larger group. It's actually a lot of activity and a lot of discussion and a lot of interaction. Um, each participant joins a team and they identify a team-based project and they work on this project as a collaborative team across the course of a year and two more workshops after workshop one. The photos that you see up here are our colleagues in Norway, all engaged in the highly interactive Leadership for Change um, program. Most of the learning actually occurs in the group work and the collaboration on the change project. And the didactic is really just the platform that starts the discussion going. So now we're going to hear from some key nursing leaders across the world who have already participated in the Leadership for Change program. And they're gonna tell us how this program has impacted them as well as their ability to affect change. We wanted to do a program about communication among female leaders because our health minister stated that we needed more uh, female health leaders at the hospital and uh, we wanted to look into that and uh, why aren't they applying why don't they feel confident we uh, wanted to see how women communicated uh, versus men and uh, made a communication uh, course for female leaders to try to communicate more precise and clearly to have more influence on decision making mm -hmm. The title of our project is uh, to enhance nurse physician communication through using the ISBAR communication tool. The ISBAR stands for Introduction, Situation, Background, Assessment, and Recommendation. So this has shown that this communication tool improves patient safety. And we thought that this would be a great project because we have experienced several issues of miscommunication between nurses and physicians. We trained the nurses how to use the tool, how to report to physicians about patients' conditions using this tool. We had uh, around uh, 420 participants. We noticed an improvement concerning patterns of communication. We encounter patients coming to ER for their insulin use that's uh, given in the morning and in the afternoon. And it's uh, sort of like overstrain the ER nurses for doing that. When I try to join that ICN LFC, I try to bring that up. And then when I came back to EBI, I did my um, survey and find out what is the root cause. See, I found out that it's because of lack of supply or unstable, instability of either the insulin drug or the insulin syringes. I worked with the diabetic program. Um, 
to increase the number of insulin PR. And I work with the diabetic program on training patients that are capable of doing the injection to themselves or any family member that can do it to the patient instead of the patient is scared to do it. And at the end of the program, I actually went down to only 20 people going to ER for the insulin injection out of 100 with the start of the project. I can say the impact of the LFC program cannot be overstated. It has been very significant. There was many significant LFC projects covered the following area: management, infection control, communication, and health education. We saw that the participants we all grew during that program. I gained the uh, insights through participating about my leadership style and uh, collaborating with seven leaders across Lebanon was very challenging and uh, it was a great uh, learning experience. We presented at a national conference in the world. We presented at the ICN Congress in Singapore. We are thinking about the national level to collaborate with the Order of Nurses in Lebanon to uh, present this work. We also are working on publishing this project as well. Nurses graduate from the school here. They are not just ready to be left alone in the world in the clinical services. And people or students that are going into nursing, but when they finish the graduate, they end up dispersing into other department because possibly of the salary, this is one. Sometimes there is not much support from the ministry because not all of them sometimes are being hired because of the budget constraint. The greatest challenge, I believe, is nurses' retention. We have an issue with immigration because uh, the Lebanese nurses are heavily recruited by the Gulf area, by Europe, and by the United States. The nurses can be retained on both national level and institutional level. Most of the nurses with bad working conditions in Lebanon are leaving the profession. We have to retain them. So there will not be enough nurses or nurses specialists in the future. If all people can't be nurses, there will be a shortage of nurses and we will be forced to work more across professions. Okay. So we've heard from some leaders across the world. And as I hope that you um, saw, um, the participants reported feeling transformed, better able to influence policy, and more confident in their leadership capabilities. Their leadership, or these leaders, they actually recognized a need for a change. Work, they worked diligently with active communication, um, aggressive collaboration, um, and basic tenacity with sticking through it. And um, this is just a sample of what we um, found with the Leadership for Change program. Um, Dr. Wang Da Dei from Taiwan noted, the LFC helped me boost my self-confidence, increase courage, grab the chance, and make changes. If they could do it, you could do it. Now we're going to hear from Claire Med who is going to tell you a little bit, um, some further detail about the Leadership for Change program. Claire? Thanks very much, Chris, and uh, hello to everyone. Thanks for joining this webinar, and thanks, Chris, for providing some insight into uh, nursing leadership today, and also talking a little bit about our, our Leadership for Change program. 
Um, as Chris said, this program has been running since the mid 1990s and it's been conducted in more than 70 countries. You've heard from some of those countries uh, and today we've still got 20 active countries planning LFC programs, particularly into 2020. And some examples of that include uh, China, they're partway through developing a program that will deliver training to 500 nurses across 12 provinces in the country. And they've managed to secure sponsorship uh, along with ICM from Johnson & Johnson. India is also looking to follow suit. They want to train 2,000 nurses over a period of a couple of years. And they're looking to follow the steps of China. They're looking for sponsors to support them. And they're looking to work with ICN to implement the Leadership for Change program. So I hope this has inspired you uh, in exploring whether it's the Leadership for Change or other programs that will meet the Nightingale Challenge that Nursing Now has set. If you're interested in the Leadership for Change program, then please approach your local national nursing associations. Those are the organizations that host Leadership for Change and ICN work with those organizations to make sure that they're set up with a a license to deliver the program. We support them with training leaders in their country and to start that process sometimes we use regional trainers so you saw in some of the material that Chris presented Taiwan has been supporting their region particularly Myanmar um, and, and other and Cambodia and other other places uh, other countries near near to them. Um, so if you are interested please, uh, you can contact us at ICN through our website. Um, and now if we'd like to move to any questions or comments, uh, we'd be clear, pleased to hear from you. Great, uh, thank you very much, Claire. So um, perhaps we can have some of the comments or questions read to us so that everybody can hear them and then Claire or myself um, can answer them. Great, thank you so much, Chris and Claire. Um, if, if anyone has any questions, um, please just type them into the, the panel now um, and then we can read them out for you, just to reiterate that. Thank you very much. Um, and to start off, um, a few of you sent some questions um, prior to the webinar, so thank you for those. I'll just read a, a couple of those out whilst um, we have some questions typed up, if that's okay. Um, so uh, many of these were based upon um, more towards the Nightingale Challenge. So we had some questions from Debbie Cromack, who is the Learning, Education and Nursing Development Manager um, from the Nurse Development Team at the Bradford District Care NHS Foundation Trust. And the first question was, will there be a mechanism for us to link across the country and wider across the globe with partner organisations, e.g. peer opportunities for our Nightingale nurses? So yes, currently actually for the UK, we're, um, we're in the process of talking to the nursing now groups and creating a platform, an online platform for um, employers and nurses to be able to communicate with each other and partner and share ideas. Um, so that should be launching soon. And that's, that's also dealt on a case by country by country basis. And also if any um, employers or organizations want to partner, um, then please contact us directly and state your um, desire to do so, and then we can arrange partnerships that way. Um, a, another question from Debbie was, can we call them Nightingale nurses whilst on the year long program? Yes, absolutely. Um, you're welcome to mark up as you like. Um, and then we have a question from Beatrice Amuge, who's the Assistant Commissioner of Nursing Services um, at Malago National Referral Hospital in Uganda. And she asked, um, what is the financial support available to low income countries and how can employers from these countries benefit from it? So the um, funding is available to low-income countries on a case-by-case -case basis 
Um, so if this is something that you're interested in, then we would need to hear from you directly and then you can contact us about that, um, requesting funding for your programs. And then we will work to partner with other organizations and find that funding for you. Um, so yeah. Okay. So it looks like we have um, a question from Liz, um, which was, thank you for the presentation. Um, we are new in the nursing now and have three young head nurses assistants to join nursing now. Um, where to start? So, um, I'm assuming that means for the, for the Nightingale Challenge, please. Um, so the thing to do now would be to start um, thinking about your programs and how you want to initiate that leadership um, program for 2020. Um, we have a number of resources on, the, on our website and the brochure of um, examples of what that can look like. Um, and that can include you know, taking some of the online resources such as the Leadership for Change um, program and the IHI Open School on our online um, that can involve mentoring and secondments uh, across organizations. Um, but really it's, it's, it's non-prescriptive and we want every organization um, to decide how they want to train these nurses um, provided what, what, what resources they have from their organization. So it is, um, it is ultimately up to you to decide what you want to do. We just ask that the, the training involves some form of leadership and isn't solely clinical. So thank you for that question, Lise. Um, Okay, so we had one from Lise as well. Is it possible to have the recording of the webinar to show to our Nightingale Challenge, please? Um, and that's Lisa from Betsy Cadwallader University Health Board. Um, yes, absolutely. So we're gonna put the, um, the recording of the webinar on our website, on the Nightingale Challenge. So you should have access to that and you'll be able to use that um, to show your Nightingale Challenge cohorts. And um, we have a question from Roisin Fitzsimons uh, from Geyser St. Thomas's Hospital um, in the UK. She said, hi, I was interested to hear about the quadruple aim, particularly about the work-life balance. Thinking about young nurses in particular, we are finding resilience is a challenge. This may be due to a number of issues, high acuity patients, variety in the role and expectations of young nurses to the profession. Are other organizations seeing the same? What are people doing to support resilience? Any ideas, suggestions, gratefully received? Um, I, I can start to um, start the discussion on that if that's okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful question. So let me give you a bit of a background. The quadruple aim started out as what was called the triple aim, meaning three instead of four. And the triple aim had improved health um, and high quality care, um, satisfied patients and reduced care cost. So they wanted good care with happy patients at a low cost. And what they realized was in order to do that is you have to have a highly functioning, satisfied, happy workforce because the most important um, asset that any healthcare organization has even if it has the best, best technology, is its healthcare workforce. That's the most precious asset. And remember, nursing is the largest segment of the healthcare workforce across the world. So when they revised the triple aim to be called the quadruple aim, that really sent a loud message out that someone has finally gotten it and understands that it's the workforce which is actually the key to having improved health outcomes related to quality care, satisfied customers at a reduced care cost. So you will see going forward a renewed 
an emergence of a renewed emphasis on um, the healthcare workforce. And that includes the nursing workforce because nursing is the one profession that staffs a hospital largely 24 seven, 365 days um, a year. So how can you, how can you um, assure that you have a good work-life balance? Well, um, some of our Leadership for Change participants have actually asked that question. So in China, two different groups actually, um, they knew intuitively and from their experience that there were significant problems and that the nurses were not happy. Everything from health, health um, workplace injuries to excessive absenteeism, which is really a symptom of um, problems at the work setting, um, forced overtime, fatigue, et cetera. So because they didn't have numbers, they just knew that it existed. That team actually decided to um, do a widespread survey across um, across the health system, which had 2000, it was a 2000 bed hospital. It's a very large hospital. They surveyed every nurse in the hospital and they collected data about the workplace environment and work-life balance. They now have that data and they can use that data to go to the policy table and say, this is what, this is the condition of the workforce. And these are the recommendations we have to um, um, address it. In other um, venues or other countries or other regions or states, people may have that data already. And if that's the case, then you can start tying that data to adverse outcomes. And when you do that, you can actually show that it actually saves money when you have um, a healthy um, wor workforce that has good work-life balance. Um, you actually have fewer medical errors. Medical errors are very costly. Um, you have better patient satisfaction because people aren't exhausted and cranky and tired. And you save money because you have shorter lengths of stay. So it depends upon um, how much you know about it. If you know it exists but you don't have specifics, then the first thing I would suggest you do is you survey it. And you can do that with... Um, a quantitative survey with questionnaires, but I also encourage you have some focus groups and collect some qualitative data. Um, because when you only ask people things with paper, <coughs> you only get answers to the questions you ask. And when you speak to people, um, you get information that you weren't even thinking about. And excuse me, I'm gonna take a sip of water. <coughs> I hope that was helpful. Is there another question? Well, Claire, do you want to add something to that? <coughs> no, I think what you've said is really, really, um, you know, to the point, Chris. Um, the, the only other uh, point that um, is worth mentioning is the, the need to continue to, to collect data on nursing. <coughs> number of nurses in country basic data which is something that ICN is working on with the World Health Organization particularly for the year of the nurse to collect data on nursing numbers of nurses outcomes of nurses because that also helps to demonstrate uh, and uh, and show that um, the uh, getting the right balance of nurses in the workplace also supports that um, uh, feeling of well-being uh, for, for nurses. So uh, that's, that's just a little addition. Things such as precision health, we mentioned precision health before, I'll flip that up. Um, precision health actually might increase the need for nursing services. Right now, nursing care is standardized. If you come in with a stroke or a heart attack or a GI problem, you pretty much get the standard, we call them standards of care, and they're sort of like it's a checkbook list of things that, that almost everybody gets. With precision health, while it's more pre precise for the individual, it um, increases the diversity of nursing care. So each person gets an individually tailored set of um, care that's hand tailored for them. And we don't know yet, will that require more nurses? 
is that going that may not increase nursing efficiency <laughs> you get efficiency when you get the economies of scale everybody gets sort of the same thing right um, with precision health you won't have that so some of these things that um, they they already exist they're just not that widespread as they emerge um, nursing is going to have to play close attention to it and say where can we contribute how will we fit in and for us to fit in how do we get skilled up so that we actually can come to the policy table and know enough about these topics to actually even talk about them great thank you chris um we had a follow-up question from Roisin who said, really helpful, thank you. Um, was the survey validated and could you signpost to any references? Um, the survey that they used in China was there are um, nursing surveys from multiple countries that have been validated. So if you do a literature search, um, you can find them, um, but if not, you can contact me. I'll give you my email and I can um, find you some validated tools. But you have to look at the country that it's validated in. And if it's not your country, you then need to really read the questions and make sure that those questions are applicable and appropriate um, for your country. They not only match the services, but they match the context, the context and the wording and the terminology. So um, I would suggest you don't start with a blank piece of paper. You take something that has been validated by um, in another area, but then you have to go back and you need to validate it for your country if it wasn't from your country. Um, an easy way to do that is to you start with the survey and you can do um, process, the term is called cognitive testing. You get three or four people in the room who would be a typical survey um, participant, and you read one question at a time and you ask them, what does that question mean to you? And what they report back to you should be sort of what you have in your mind to ask in that question. If it doesn't, you come up together um, with rewording where everybody in the room agrees, yes, this actually represents what it is we want to ask. You then, when you get your final survey together with, the, um, with that, you then bring it to some experts in your country, in nursing, and you say, does this survey ask the proper questions for this particular topic? And that's called content or expert validity. So um, there are two simple steps that you can use. And I think for use in a hospital setting where you're not doing this for research, um, you don't have to start doing um, statistical um, tests on it. It, it. This will get you to where you want to go. And um, at the end, I can give everybody my email. And if you need a little assistance um, with finding them, you can email me and I'll be more than glad to send you a copy. Um, one other thing I'd like to add, um, the A1, um, the Association of Nurse Executives, the Nurse Organization Executives, they have um, workplace um, nursing um, satisfaction surveys, workplace balance surveys. Um, I know the American Nursing Association has it. Many of the larger countries, I'm sure the Australia Nursing Association has one. So many of the large countries um, have surveys that they've actually given in their country. So if your country does not, first start with your country nursing association, if they have not developed one, then take one from some other place, but then be sure to um, contextualize it for your, your, um, your country. Thanks so much, Chris. It looks like there aren't currently any other questions. Okay. Um, so yeah, so thank you so much for joining us. That was brilliant to hear from you, Claire and Chris. Um, if you, if anyone has any questions for uh, regarding the Nightingale Challenge, then please contact us at nightingalenursingnow.global, which I'll type into the um, chat box. And yeah, Chris, if you want to 
provides. Could, you, could uh, you type my email into the chat box so people could see it? Sure. Okay. It's K Q U R E. Q U R E. Yep. S H I. Mm -hmm. At Hawaii H A W A I I. Dot E D U. Wonderful. That's in there now. Okay. Great. And for ICN, if there's any questions or comments around specifically the leadership for change, if we could just go to the last page of the presentation, Chris. It's got the ICN website, and you can go onto the ICN website, and there's a contact us section. So if you just uh, send us your comments there, that would be fine. It's, uh, uh, we lost it. I don't know what I did here. The last page, Chris. Here we are. I'm Last page, here we are. Okay. That's the last page, yeah? Yes. That's it. That's got our Twitter handle on it on the right hand side, and our email address is www.icn.ch. So please find us there and send contact details. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining into the first webinar. It was great to have you. Thank you. Bye-bye now.